Hello and welcome to this edition of TZM Global Radio. I'm your host for today, James Phillips from the UK chapter of the Zeitgeist Movement and TZM Education. Hope you're all doing well out there, guys. The introduction for today's show was from the wonderful comedic talents of Monty Python, um, showing you uh, what can happen to you when you get your communication wires crossed. Um, however, it's probably unlikely that you would have such a translation book in your hands as the Hungarian translation book in that sketch, or at least um, hopefully not. Um, but um, it nonetheless goes through uh, misunderstanding and, um, and how amusing that can be. Unfortunately, it's not always amusing, especially in our trade, where we're trying to communicate uh, a new socio-economic model that requires a shift in the value set of our species on this planet. Um, no small task, it has to be said, and um, an incredibly challenging one. Uh, made ever more challenging if we're not going to pay attention to what communicational methods work. So later on in this radio show, and not too much later, I'm going to um, be reading the next article from the Minds in the Making section of uh, TZM Education website entitled Riding a Trojan Horse to an NLRBE and uh, all shall become clear on that in due course. But first of all, a little bit of news, relevant news. The uh, lectures from Z-Day Berlin are still in the making. Um, a few of them have come out and uh, will be will be released shortly, uh, mine included, hopefully. So, um, uh, and, and uh, various other ones are still rolling in from Z-Day events around the world. Um, I hope some people out there are giving con some consideration to the uh, putting on some kind of media event later on in the year, whether that be just inviting a few people round to watch you play your guitar in your front room <laughs> to uh, organising a, a local event with musicians and artists and, and other things. Um, art is a wonderful way of um, spreading a new value system uh, uh, that humanity could start to adopt if we were actually realistic about reaching some of our uh, loftier and more humane ideals. The other piece of news I'd, I'd like to divulge is um, that we are now taking submissions for TZM Global Radio and that's fallen upon my shoulders to sort of um, take in some of those submissions. Um, I think the easiest way to do it initially would be to just get in touch with me either via Facebook, I, I'm James Phillips on Facebook, or um, at my email which is jamesshock at hotmail.co.uk um, just if you're sending an email or something if you could in, just entitle it tzm global or uh, that would be helpful it's obviously as you probably noticed um fallen on myself and peter to be doing the uh, lion's share of the broadcasts for tzm global but we we need some more voices out there and um, so if you feel that you've got something to contribute or want to deliver a radio show and want to do as I am doing now and pretty much just talk at a laptop <laughs> or, or better still um, get some interviews perhaps going on with um, various people surrounding the sorts of topics that we discuss. Uh, anything like that would be absolutely fantastic and if you could pre-record those and send them to me um, that would be much appreciated. Um, the job of communication needs to be a collective effort so uh, yeah get in touch. Um, without further ado I'm going to switch to um, my reading of this article because it is quite a long one and um, I hope that you get something from it and then I'll come back to close the show. So without further ado, here is Article 9 from the Minds in the Making section of the TZME website, uh, entitled Riding a Trojan Horse to an NLRBE. Riding a Trojan Horse to an NLRBE. According to the legend, after a fruitless 10-year siege during the Greek Trojan War, the Greeks constructed a horse and hid a force of men inside. They then pretended to sail away, and the Trojans pulled the horse into their city as a victory trophy. That night, the Greek force crept out of the horse and opened the gates for the rest of the returning Greek army to enter. 
The term Trojan horse is often employed in popular speech as a metaphor for sympathising with someone's point of view to create the psychological ground by which to establish the merit of your own perspective. This approach can work because when people feel their position is threatened, the likelihood is that they will either attack or defend their position in retaliation. If our intention, therefore, is to engage in effective communication, then we should first ensure that we make every attempt to try and loosen the psychological ground of what can be a difficult idea for most to consider. The Trojan horse method can certainly aid in this regard if skillfully employed. Before embarking on outlining some of these arguments, however, we would be wise to first take a thorough inventory of our own personal lifestyle choices and communicative approach to ensure to the best of our ability that our own house is in order, so to speak. If we do not do so and act in haste to communicate this idea with others, then we could forever alienate many to the positive prospect of using the scientific method for social concern. Leading by example in this manner could also be said to be a form of communication in and of itself as well, of course, so it seems worthy of outlining several aspects of this personal interrogation. Commanding intellectual and personal respect. <clears throat> Fixedness and dogmatic persistence to cling to any unsubstantiated beliefs is an anath anathema to the scientific method and can be extremely damaging to human and environmental well-being, as well as an obstacle to social progress. For advocates of the scientific method for social concern, it is perhaps even more vital for us to do our utmost to ensure the scientific efficacy of the, our claims on any subject we choose to comment on for two reasons. The first is that the inherent nature of the method we advocate requires both an open mind to new ideas while simultaneously using a rigorous scepticism regarding the facts supporting our claims. This point is outlined in the following excerpt from the book The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. And that video is entitled Carl Sagan's The Marriage of Scepticism and Wonder. In aiming to perform such an analysis, we should always strive to maintain a constant and honest assessment of our personal opinions and the opinions of others to ensure that we only use the most credible possible sources on which to base our judgments. This sentiment is well expressed in the following video, Symphony of Science, and that's entitled Symphony of Science, A Wave of Reason. There are many pitfalls to which human thought can fall victim, and many fallacies which can give the impression that something is true when it isn't. This is the whole point of science, to strive to gain an, a closer approximation of the truth by testing out our ideas against the benchmark of nature. One practical suggestion to make in this regard is to recognise our propensity for cognitive bias and fallibility um, and place an emphasis on the importance of delaying our conclusions until we check the counter-argument of any particular subject or claim being made. These points and others are outlined by Richard Feynman in the following interview. And that video is entitled Richard Feynman, The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. The second reason to ensure we use only the most credible of sources for any point of view we express is one of personal relations. The opinions and viewpoints we express over seemingly unrelated topics will undoubtedly draw an association toward our promotion of the NLRBE by extension as well. If these associated views are shown to be lacking in credibility, then this will likely arouse suspicion in others towards the credibility of the NLRBE as well. Striking the common ground. Although it is important to elevate critical thinking in general and to question ideas, there is a time, place and manner by which to do so. This requires a deft and varied amount of communicative skill, diplomacy and tactical repertoire. Some of these methods are outlined in the article An Effective Communicative Approach. An Inclusive Social Movement It seems to me at least that many of the issues and topics discussed online and in general public discourse become moot once the case for an NLRBE can be properly established. This is why I try to make it my personal priority to focus my efforts on the avocation of this new social model. The reason this communicative stance is so important is worthy of a brief recap which may hopefully help in your own communications. <clears throat> 
Whilst we may disagree with each other over politics, business, religion, philosophy, morals or ethics, we all have the same needs. We need food, warmth, clothing, shelter, nutritious food, clean air, clean drinking water, positive relationships, good health care and the means by which to learn about the world around us. For these needs to be met in a sustainable way for all, we require a decision-making method that people from different countries, cultures and backgrounds can use in collaboration to come to some sort of agreement and work together eventually. The decision-making method that has shown efficacy consistently in this regard over generational time is the scientific method. We use science every time we open a door, turn the lights on, call a friend on the phone or go on a car journey and it is responsible for raising the standard of living of humanity to levels that would have seemed like witchcraft not too long ago. This method has however never been liberally applied to our social system in a truly holistic or humane manner as the technology did not exist to achieve this ambition on a global scale until very recently in our history. Were we to do so, without the artificial and technical limitations inherent to the use of politics, money and business, we could raise the standard of living to levels far in excess of what even the wealthiest currently experience today, ushering in an age of sustainable, global access abundance to meet the needs of all the world's people. I have yet to find a person who can disagree with this general outline regarding what decision-making method is best for delivering the global collaboration clearly needed to address the issues now facing our interconnected planetary species. If the actual state of current technological capability to solve human problems can be divulged to the general public in a digestible and intriguing way, then the question of why we are not using this technology for human concern can be left for people to ponder further in their own time. This method of Socratic questioning seems to be the path of least resistance and one capable of striking common ground with the most people possible. This perspective does not mean that everyone must become an expert in every area of science or that anyone would be forced to accept this economic model or indeed that all decisions in such a system would be made by an elite group. It simply means that if you want to address a problem in such a society, then you will need to learn about the field of study that pertains to that problem you are trying to address and demonstrate repeatable test results to your peers before your idea is adopted. Once again, this is a reasonable proposition to almost everyone, but runs in stark contrast to the decision-making arena of politics and monetary economics and is precisely why such a system is often very hard for many to consider in a world immersed in politics and business. The simplicity of the argument for the NLRBE is made in the following video by Peter Joseph which can be an excellent tool to use as a brief and simplistic intro introduction to the idea and that's entitled TEDx OJ, uh, OJ. Um, Peter Joseph, the big question. <clears throat> time is precious. Regardless of what we choose to spend our time doing, we would be well to do well to remember that every second we are doing something is another second we will never get back to use on doing something else, which could be a potentially far more beneficial use of our time in initiating the much needed shift towards a more peaceful and sustainable social system. The Trojan Horse Communication Method It is my disposition that it is far better to agree wherever possible on at least the level of frustration and concern felt by those we are communicating with, leaving periphery issues to one side if at all possible. This approach should not be taken as simply ducking the issue at hand, but rather one of tactics. As the old saying goes, pick your battles. There's no guarantee that such subtle tactics will always work, of course, but we must go with the most likely chance of a positive result. So considering that we tend to be drawn to those who are friendly, welcoming and open to our perspective and share our values, if we, then if we align with these as best we can, then the person we are communicating with will be far more likely to consider the overall point we are making in due course. Some of these tactics are outlined by Jacques Fresco in the following example, and that video is entitled Jacques Fresco. Jacques Fresco talks on how he turned the clan. And then there's a further um, uh, video that's worth checking out entitled The Venus Project talks about Jacques Fresco's mother being racist. 
positive manipulation. This may seem like manipulation, and that is because it is precisely what it is. We are all trying to do this more often than we either realise or care to admit, and there is actually nothing wrong with it in my view. As with most things, it depends on your intentions in doing so. As long as we keep our own epistemological process in mind, accepting that we could be wrong in our opinion and be willing to change it if better evidence is presented, then certain tactics in conversation should not be seen as a negative thing, but rather as a positive method of interaction that could be potentially useful in shifting humanity's collective social values for the better. What does the term value shift actually mean? We are all hypocrites to some degree in a price system. We want to see a world based on the intelligent management of the Earth's resources and the meeting of human needs sustainably without the need for a price tag and yet we all have jobs. We want a world without war and yet our taxes pay for the armies and navies which fight them. It's simply a sliding scale of degree as to personal circumstance and where we are in the social hierarchy as to what we can actually achieve inside a socio-economic system predicated on waste, inefficiency and self-preservation in which those with the most money have the most say. That being said, it should also hopefully be obvious that if you hold and promote unsubstantiated, abhorrent or violent perspectives, drive a hummer, sell arms and eat steak for breakfast, lunch and dinner whilst also claiming to support an NLRBE, um, then the fact that all of these uh, behaviours are clearly unsustainable, detrimental and socially offensive should not be overlooked just because we live in a price system. This is an uh, obtuse an extreme perspective ultimately to take. Not only is this a complete cop-out as well but it also hinders your ability to argue for a new sustainable economic model based on the intelligent management of the Earth's resources as well. For sanity's sake it is worthwhile to keep in mind that radical change of the sort we advocate is usually painstaking, gradual and takes a great deal of poise, patience and leading by example in highly difficult and challenging circumstances. Occasionally a change in someone's values looks like it happened in the blink of an eye, but all that really means is that you did not see all of the incremental steps before this crystallization effect took place. This perspective may help make the, tacti the tactic of planting seeds an easier strategy to adopt. The role of satire in shifting values. The issue of effective communication is a complex one, and even having said all that I have thus far regarding the importance in establishing empathy with someone where possible, we would be foolish to ignore the major role that satire can play in breaking down communication barriers and helping to shape new perspectives. This usually only happens with issues the person in question already sympathises with, or is as yet undecided about, helping to cast them in a new light. For this reason, using this approach can be difficult to judge regarding where the person you are communicating with stands regarding the issue at hand. Nonetheless, it remains a great tactic for slipping in behind the defences of our conscious mind and laughing at our own internal contradictions and failings, allowing the space for personal values to shift. Some of my personal favourites in this style of communication are included below, and that's culture in decline, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. George Carlin, the particular video I've featured there is George Carlin Doesn't Vote. Doug Stanhope, um, that particular one is on freedom. Bill Hicks, It's Just a Ride, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, some of Bill's stuff. Steve Hughes, an Australian comedian. Um, this particular video is entitled uh, Offended, a very well worth a watch. And um, Louis C.K., uh, that video is entitled Everything's Amazing, Nobody's Happy. That's really good. And Lee Camp, Advertisements Are Our Souls. And uh, of course, all of those comedians have a lot of other great work, which is um, worth checking out. <clears throat> other useful methods which can help to establish a rapport with others could be to try asking more questions in conversation or to agree with the feeling behind the need being expressed by the person at the time and going on to help to give a fresh perspective on how this need might be met. This point and many others related to this method of approach are outlined by Jen Wilding in the following talk. 
and that's entitled Zeitgeist Day 2012 Los Angeles Communicating RBE Concepts by Jen Wilding. Once again, the point of effective communication is further expanded upon in the article An Effective Communicative Approach. So, back to the theme of striking the common ground via the Trojan horse method. Here are some of the arguments that could be used in certain instances in this regard. <clears throat> Economic uncertainty, outsourcing, automation and the age of the prosumer. Due to the exponential rate of technological development, the likelihood is that many of the jobs we would have never been able to imagine as being done by machines increasingly will be. It has been the case that with the technological leaps of the past, that new labour sectors have emerged in their wake. Technological unemployment is therefore sometimes labelled by its critics as the Luddite fallacy, which can be understood by clicking on the following link. And that link is uh, the wiki for technological unemployment. <clears throat> Basically, this states that as areas of the economy becomes automated, human beings retrain in new sectors and employment keeps up pace with technological development. Though this is not fact uh, factoring in the retraining time and expense incurred in lost earnings in the interim for people, of course. However, even the most notable economists and academics are finally facing up to the fact that the speed of the rate of this exponential trend in technological development is now starting to outpace our capability to retrain in new sectors. For a deeper insight and understanding of this topic, I recommend visiting the following website. And that website is www.robotswillstealyourjob.com. And by watching the following documentary, we'll work for free. Um, <clears throat> So, the future certainly seems more unpredictable than ever with regards to the sanctity of many jobs we would have come to think of as sacrosanct in the economy. This trend looks like it could pave the way for more creative and life-enhancing job roles to come to the fore in the future labour market, with tasks of a repetitive or information-crunching nature being increasingly taken over by machines. This point is made in the following talk by Daniel Pink regarding his book A Whole New Mind and that's entitled Daniel Pink A Whole New Mind. These trends bring with them another challenge, zero marginal cost. The age of the prosumer, which is an increasing convergence of producers, distributors and consumers via such avenues as 3D printing, the internet of things and the collaborative commons, are gradually edging their way into the market making utility items, gifts and other products cost increasingly less with serious knock-on effects to all other areas of the economy. This point is expanded upon in the following video by Jeremy Rifkin, entitled Jeremy Rifkin on the Fall of Capitalism and the Internet of Things. A change in economic reality equals a change in educational incentives. Given that extrinsic motivation has been shown to work for the sort of jobs that are likely to be phased out through automation, please see the article A Change in Educational and Social Incentives for more information on the topic of human motivation. What should our response to educational approach be for these uncertain times that lay ahead? Education shapes the future of our economy to a large extent. Um, please see the article Education Reflects Culture and Culture Reflects Education for more on this topic. So it seems that an educational approach geared towards fostering creative skills, autonomy, mastery and purpose would be the most appropriate response regardless of your socio-political or economic persuasion. This requires an educational and business model more akin to the approach outlined in the talk by Daniel Pink mentioned earlier. An educational model attempting to pro promote many of these attributes is Montessori schools. And the video I've included here is Introduction to Montessori and the Montessori Foundation. <clears throat> An education fit for the information age. In the age of open access to information, the population at large must be well adept in evaluating the validity of the information to which they are exposed, as the subsequent actions taken by them can have serious and detrimental consequences for both themselves and everyone else in society. The readiness to take the word of an authority figure or settle on an opinion based on a logical fallacy must be mitigated for via the promotion of critical thinking in our educational institutions, regardless of our preferred socio-economic model, if the overall health of society is our collective goal.
a point well made in the following video by Brian Dunning from um, Skeptoid.com entitled The Importance of Teaching Critical Thinking. An amusing summary of some of the most common logical fallacies we are susceptible to is summed up in the following infographic and that you can find at yourlogicalfallacyis.com. A global education movement to initiate the teaching of critical thinking as a subject in schools worthy of further, further investigation is Thinking Schools. And if you go to www.thinkingschool.co.uk, um, then you can find out more information about that. <clears throat> An education fit for democracy. Democracy in its various incantations is not merely mob rule. There are stipulations in place in the form of constitutions and rights via the rule of law to ensure, supposedly at least, that the will of the people is carried out. This point and others are outlined by Federico Pastono in the following video. And that video is entitled Democracy, Technocracy, the Free Market or the Scientific Method for Social Concern. If this were your preferred system of societal governance, then the backbone of such a structure is still contingent upon the general public's ability to think critically about the leaders they elect. If this is not the case, then the integrity of any society will be compromised, as the people will be far more likely to accept weak arguments from incompetent leadership, leaving themselves and their society open for a potentially hostile takeover. Given this set of criteria, it would surely make sense to ensure that children are encouraged in our schools to question illegitimate authority, spot logical fallacies, and become active participants in the process of their own education. An educational approach with this aim in mind is democratic schools, and that video is entitled Make Your Voice Heard, Discover Democratic Education. And as I mentioned in a previous radio show, I would highly recommend checking out Summer Hill School, which was the originator of that particular model of education. The argument from a religious perspective. <clears throat> Most people of a religious persuasion tend to focus on the aspects of their faith that call for a more peaceful, charitable and compassionate approach to their fellow man. The Trojan horse approach in this instance would be to appeal to this disposition in the guise of establishing a socio-economic model capable of delivering on these aims, eloquently expressed by Jacques Fresco in the following clip, and that's entitled Jacques Fresco on Language, Spirituality and Christianity. I have had the opportunity to try this approach on several occasions personally even acting as a member of the congregation in a church environment and using some of the chapter and verses in the Bible to get across the need to address the inadequacies of our current social system and have received an equally positive and neg negative response when doing so. The positive response is usually along the lines that they agree that we should be doing the best by our fellow man by observing the golden rule. Um, to check out more on that have a look at the wiki as outlined through various religious teachings and uh, state that these sentiments should be conveyed in deed rather than merely words. The negative response tends to be that they are waiting for the next life and plan to get there through faith and prayer or perhaps that this world is evil and they're waiting for a messiah to come and save them from or save us from ourselves. <clears throat> I have found there is little that can be done with the latter response, but at least this general tactic of approach garnered a positive response from a sizable amount of those of a religious persuasion, whereas my previous hostile one was only ever met with an equal, equivalent hostility and zero success. I appreciate the issues that many people have with religious dogma and faith-based allegiance especially when it leads to the sorts of cruel and despotic acts as it historically has and continues to show its ability to do so. Once again, however, the question should be what we want to achieve and what our primary method of approach is in attempting to do so. The most relevant question then becomes what works when delivering the idea of an NLRBE to bring people from all backgrounds and cultures together. Attacking their position will surely only make them increasingly hostile to the idea of an NLRBE, and we cannot possibly think that such religious views will have to be overcome in full before we can arrive at such a social condition, 
If that is the case, then I personally find the prospect of an NLRBE extremely unlikely indeed. Perhaps we will never overcome mankind's belief in superstition and mysticism, but personally speaking, if we can ultimately get to the stage where we can at least say that we are housing, clothing and feeding everyone on earth and are no longer at war with each other, then to put it frankly, I don't give a shit. Whilst on the road to such a world, however, any particularly extreme or harmful practices, religious or otherwise, should not be tolerated, overlooked or go unchallenged. It seems that we should perhaps reserve our condemnation and criticisms for these moments rather than the vast amount of time spent on attacking those who are the peaceful proponents of the more morally sound aspects of their particular faith. This is not to say that we cannot or should not criticise bad ideas, and there is certainly a time and place to voice concerns over religious belief in general, so please bear in mind that I am merely talking about this subject within the context of conveying the important need for the transition to an NLRBE. <clears throat> For example, let's for argument's sake entertain the notion that we establish an NLRBE in a world with no money, no poverty, no war and the needs of the human population met, the need for religious faith would likely be greatly diminished as there is no longer the need for charity or praying for a peaceful world or an end to poverty. If after these issues have been addressed, people still wish to follow a particular faith, then so be it. As long as we rely on the methods of science to ensure that human needs are met in the most sustainable and efficient manner possible, rather than superstition, then people can, of course, follow whatever faith they like. This is clearly a massive topic, and one with various tangents, so I'll not dwell on it any further, but rather leave some of these points for you to consider within the context of communicating the concept of an NLRBE. Are the Trojan horse arguments above enough to establish an NLRBE? <clears throat> well, the short answer is no. And the long answer is not that much longer either, in fact, and it's this. Why leave things down to chance when we have a better alternative on offer? The NLRBE is an alternative which we could adopt were we to adapt our values and behaviour to support such a system. This is something we've done before and which with the right educational approach we can do again. We have seen massive changes in social attitude and practices over the course of human history, and in the last hundred years especially, so it seems that there is no reason to think why we cannot do so again in the next hundred. For example, the following study shows that in the initial stages of transition at least, you may not need that many people in favour of shifting public opinion for an inertia effect to start to take place in social attitudes. That link is from Freakonomics.com um, and the uh, search to the thing you're looking for is minority rules, why 10% is all you need. <clears throat> A system disorder. The corrosive effects of the current socio-economic system will not be solved within the paradigm which created them. The entire edifice of our economic system is based on increased consumption and the preservation of inefficiency. This leads to waste, competition and gaming strategy inherently by default. Given such an underpinning, the collaborative and interconnected approach needed to address the many issues now facing humanity collectively is diametrically and structurally opposed by our competitive and consumption-driven socio-economic system and must be overcome. Not via protest or appeals to authority per se, but via an active change in our personal and collective values in each and every aspect of our lifestyle and habits. From what we buy, to where we buy it, how we buy it, who we bank with, where we live, how we live, what we eat and how we act in our everyday lives, we must strive to make the necessary changes that both undermine the current system and build the new one from within the old. This will provide a far smoother transition to a sustainable socio-economic system. If an NLRBE should never come about, then at least you can say that you lived a life in accordance with what you thought was right in your short tenure of this planet. This, if nothing else, is an achievement to be proud of. These points regarding transition are expressed in the following talk by Peter Joseph, and that is the lecture entitled Where Are We Now? 
This tactic of the welcoming of organisations who share these concerns but perhaps do not see the necessity to advocate the NLRB explicitly is outlined in the following talk by James Phillips. And that's entitled Z Day London 2013. James Phillips joining the dots, drawing the picture of transition. And in the subsequent presentation series, entitled um, uh, if, you, if you go and type in um, from social symptom to root cause um, eight series presentation the zeitgeist movement something along those lines you should find those videos <clears throat> creating the psychological conditions for the emergence of a new train of thought Although the case to move society and its educational approach toward the promotion of the ideas listed on this site could be made in the manner of the Trojan horse, it should also be stated that at the right point in discussion it is worth noting whether it's even worthwhile continuing on with the current model considering the da uh, damage such practices are having to human environmental well-being. This approach is essentially the knockout punch and one only worth going for when empathy has been established along with some facts regarding the current state of technological capability in addressing human and environmental problems as well if at all possible. The very last thing on the list of beneficial communicational tactics in my view is the avocation of an entirely new economic framework which would essentially render the use of a monetary system obsolete. This is too far outside the frame of reference for most to consider and something which involves a great deal of poise, patience, conversational skill and shrewd judgment to impart correctly. Dismounting from the Trojan horse. <clears throat> Having recommended the following approaches in this article, it is critical to note that it is probably not worthwhile discussing these issues with anyone who is already deeply entrenched in their current world view. It is far easier to go for the low hanging fruit if at all possible. That is, people who already sympathise with the general point regarding the current socio-economic paradigm being outdated, deeply flawed and no longer fit for purpose, to those who are actively seeking alternatives. Essentially, the groundwork has already been done in these instances and it is therefore far easier to communicate these ideas to people who sympathise with such a disposition in general. This is outlined further in the article on effective communicative approach once again. As is pointed out in the, in the Action in Education section of this site, children do not have as much mental baggage and the blockade stopping them from considering these ideas. They still dare to dream of a better future and this is why advocates of the NLRBE should hopefully see the vital importance of taking this information to them in an engaging, in an engaging way. An organisation with a kindred ambition in mind is Young Pioneers. One of Young Pioneers aims is in the promotion of positive social endeavours and sustainable practice to young people. You can find out more by visiting their website at www.ypcharity.org and I should just um, make sure that I make it abundantly clear they are actually an English charity helping deprived children is not the communist wing of the of the uh, in communist China that young pioneers <laughs> please don't get them con uh, confused we would uh, we would hate to be labeled communism wouldn't we folks <clears throat> anyway for the reasons stated above, a change in economic and social incentives as well as an equally dramatic shift in educational policy is required to face the many interconnected problems now facing humanity. If the educational models outlined in this article and on this site were adopted, the seeds could start to be sown for the susceptibility of public opinion and general social discourse for such a transition in human life to start to take place. A summary and example of some of these teaching methods are featured in the following documentaries. The Forbidden Education and an ed uh, Education for a Sustainable Future. With these points in mind, please be sure to visit the Action in Education section of this site to see how to go about enacting this much needed change in your local educational institutions. And that completes Article 9. Um, the Next and final instalment in these uh, articles that I'm reading from this site is entitled To Be Employed or Not To Be Employed, a particular Shakespearean um, play on words there for the final article. I'm sure you can probably guess what that's about. But in a sense, um, uh, just to give a little bit of a spoiler, 
it um it's going to be about whether this uh quest for employment and growth as a benchmark of of our culture's success is really a benchmark of our culture's success i suppose in a sense you could call that a continuation of a trojan horse argument because you're saying yes i think that people should have a job yes i think they should have a purpose but can we really say that the jobs that are out there all serve a decent societal function in both the person who's performing them and the person they're performing it for um is that is, is it really making us happier mm -hmm. i think you probably get a reasonable amount of agreement that the, the an awful lot of jobs now are just there for the sake of being there and someone earning money in and of itself you you could perhaps say well what's so good about uh, an arms dealer being uh, really really busy and employed and earning lots of money and creating lots of jobs uh, is that really that great a benchmark of uh, social progress you can sort of see the trojan horse going in there you're, you're agreeing that people should um, be busy you know not laying around not uh, doing nothing for society but shouldn't that job have some kind of correlation to well-being uh, whether that be uh, human or environmental or both anyway uh, obviously that article goes into a bit more detail and some other sort of connected points so I'll I'll stop with that rant there um, but just to close out this show I'll close it the way that we got started with communication and um, back to the Hungarian translation book and uh, you know you want to watch out if you've got any funny ideas from the introduction of this show if you want to go and uh, you know start um, spreading nefarious ways of communicating important dialogue and messages out there because you never know you might find yourself in court thanks very much for listening guys take care <laughs>